started a thirty thousand dollar account challenge. Okay. Where like I started an account with thirty thousand and see how far I could grow it, and I grew that thirty thousand dollar account into a million dollars in fifty five days. We're helping each other. We're both making like a lot of money. We're both killing it. Like, yeah. Why are we still not really happy with our? I thought I wanted to be like a ten twenty million dollar a year trader because like it's a lot of money and like that'd be really nice, yeah. you know. But as I've kind of matured in my trading journey, I've started to realize that like making a couple million dollars a year is pretty freaking good. Rather than devoting my entire life to trading to become that 10, 20, 30 million dollar yeah. trader when I don't really even need that type of money, I'd rather just trade for an hour a day, make my million dollars, and enjoy my life. But yeah, I think the yeah. problem that a lot of traders have, Shay, is that they are using the same size on everything. They're using 10,000 shares on their B setup, their C setup, their A setup. Every single setup, they're using the same size, and they're like, I'm losing money on these setups and I can't seem to find consistency. I can't make money. As you guys may have learned from so many of my personal stories here on the YouTube channel, that trading has truly changed my life, as well as the lives of many other trader friends I have. Today, I wanna share with you the story of Alex Tamiz. Alex is a multi-millionaire day trader who used to work as a Starbucks barista. I'm honored today to have Alex join on this conversation, and you are going to learn how to trade small cap stocks, how to develop a trading strategy that works for you, how to master position sizing and scaling in, how to manage your risk, and how to maximize your profits in all market conditions. The Humble Traders Podcast is a no BS podcast for people who want to take trading seriously and make this a true career. All I'm asking for is a gentle tap on the like button and make sure to share this podcast with your trading partners. Welcome, Alex, to the Humble Traders Podcast. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. <laughs> I've been looking forward to finally sit down with you and talk to you for a long time um, because I've been following you on Twitter and I'm sure a lot of our audience have been following you for a while too. I think I started following your journey since 2015, 2016. Um, so it's been, uh, I'm really amazed and impressed by how far you've come since then. Uh, could you share with our audience a little bit about you, your trading background, how long you've been trading, um, and what got you started in the first place? Yeah, so I'm actually coming up on my 10 year anniversary of trading. Uh, it's crazy to think that's almost been a decade. Yeah. So probably in about four to five months, I'm gonna hit the 10 year mark. So we'll throw a big party to celebrate. Okay. <laughs> um, but aside from that, I started trading when I was 19 years old. I was a barista making Starbucks at coffee. And I was think I think back then I was making about $150 a week before taxes. And Ooh. after taxes, it was like $120. Yeah. I had a girlfriend at the time and I would probably use, and gas was expensive back then too. So I'd probably take around $60, put it into my gas tank, maybe like $40, take her out to like the movies, like out to oh. dinner, like once a week. And I probably had like 20 bucks left <laughs> at the end of the week. So yeah. I was doing this for a pretty solid amount of time, but it was... The thing that really got me into trading was my girlfriend broke up with me for like a rich guy. Oh no. And my thought process was I want to get back at her by getting so rich that like she regrets it. Right. And in America, there's two ways to get rich, real estate and the stock market. Yes. Real estate has such a big barrier to entry. You need a yeah. lot of money to get into real estate. Whereas stock market these days, you could open up an account with like 500 bucks. Yeah. So I was like, perfect. You know, I have 500 bucks. I could save it up. I could yeah. do whatever. And now that I don't have to take her out to the movies or spend money on gas, <laughs> I have, you know, I'll make $500 a month, right? Yeah. So I'll work for a month. I'll take that money yeah. and I'll open up an account. So okay. I thought that it was as easy as just like buying breakouts because as you know, everyone's like, oh, just buy the breakout and it's a very simple strategy, yeah. simple pattern, and you could just make money. I was like, perfect. I saw so many advertisements, so many YouTube videos. I was like, perfect. All I have to do is buy the breakout and I'll be rich. And every single time I bought the breakout, <laughs> I had a magical talent that stocks would just crash. Yeah. Every single time I bought a stock, it would crash. Every single time, 100% of the time. I'm like, what the hell is going on here, right? Yeah. So I just kept losing money and losing money and refunding my account, $500 at a time, $500 at a time, while making coffee, while like, it, it just, it was just like a really, I was like stuck. I was really stuck in a place of just like consistently losing money. And then I discovered what short selling was, which was you can make money when stocks go down. And I actually remember my first short trade ever. I shorted 2,000 shares of a stock uh, with the ticker symbol VGGL. Okay. And it doesn't even trade anymore. And within 10 minutes, the stock went down 50 cents. Oh. I made $1,000 
and I was hooked forever. I was like, I'm gonna be rich forever, like that's it. If I have this talent of just buying stocks and they crash, if I just hit the short button yeah. and I'm, I'm just make money. So my first year, I ended up losing money. My second year that I found out about shorting, I started becoming a break-even trader. And then by my third year, I started to like slowly consistently make like, uh, like 50 to $100. And then after year four, it starts to just really explode. And now, you know, 2020, 2021, all that stuff happened and just went exponentials from there. Oh, so you, you kind of found out and you were able to start short selling relatively early on, right? Because yeah. I know, I think nowadays it takes a lot more capital to start yes. shorting with those brokers. Yes. How, I know you started with longing. So were you in a lot of these um, like chat rooms and like, like give you alerts and stuff yeah, with so, a breakout? That's a really known Yeah, like, so chat room I started strategy. off by being one of those alert people. I bought the alerts because yeah. I thought it's really simple. Like, all right, we have a millionaire here. He's gonna give me his signals <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. just gonna be rich. I'm gonna buy the breakout and I'll start calculating. All right, month one, I'm gonna make a thousand. Month two, I'm gonna make 2,000. Oh month God. three, I'm gonna, and yeah. I was like, by uh, month 12, I'm gonna yeah. be rich. Like, that's it. It's over. <laughs> like, I got it. Like, I'm done. Like, whatever. You have like a roadmap plan. I had too. a roadmap. I was oh like, God. every month, I'm gonna double my account. Every single month <laughs> until like, and then I was like, fuck, by the time I'm 25, I'm gonna have $10 million. I was oh like, God. I was like, I'm, that's it, right? That's and so that's, simple. And that's how we start, right? That's yeah. how we start. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I started with alerts until I found out that alerts didn't really work. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much lost money until the point where I, like, again, I was a little bit stuck in my trading. I really yeah. wasn't finding consistency. I was really just struggling. And then once I discovered shorting, finding that little niche back yeah. then was very different than it is now. Mm -hmm. I feel like the, the market is a little bit saturated with short sellers now yeah, because of all I the agree. AMC, Bed Bath & Beyond, yeah. all these crazy stocks that almost... Things are becoming a little bit more crowded than they used to be. Yeah. So what I used to look for back in the day was, do you know on these charts, like if you look at the daily chart, you have a stock that wicks up and then wicks down. One oh, day. yeah, yeah. Wicks up and wicks down. Yeah. So I was only waiting for those stocks on the daily chart that would okay. just wick up and wick down and only short those stocks. Okay. But it took me like three years to say, you know what, like that's what I should be waiting for. Because I see. when I started, I would just short everything. Yeah. And that was not consistent. That's yeah. not a strategy, that's not a pattern. No. So I started after a couple of years, I started to find what really worked is just waiting for that setup of looking on the daily chart, it wicks down and that's it. Every single day one, it wicks down. And yeah. I just started repeating that and repeating that, and repeating that, and that led to being a strategy, right? And what kind of stocks were you focused on during all these three years when you're learning first and then short selling and yeah. finding success? What kind of stocks specifically? So when I first started, I was looking for those one one penny stocks, like the penny oh, penny stocks. Like, you know, like the one cent, one cent, oh two God. cent, three okay. cent. And I would like go to sleep at night and I'd be like, if it's at a dollar, I'm going to make five hundred thousand oh dollars. Like, you know, God. I did the whole thing. Right. I was just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was like everyone else. Right. I was yeah. like everyone else. So I started off with the penny stocks because I thought that they had the most room to go up until I discovered that they could actually go lower than a penny. They could go like point zero 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 one. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Or like however many decimals down that it it's is. It's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. And then. Uh, small cap stocks, I really discovered that like you could short stocks like above like a dollar. So my sweet spot was like stocks between a dollar and five dollars in like the small cap world. Okay. Because the large cap world has stocks that are like a dollar to five dollars, but yeah. the float is so large that they don't really move. Yeah. Like, you know, like like a Rite Aid or like a JetBlue. JetBlue is like four dollars a share, mm -hmm. but like they don't move because like the float is so large. Yeah. So I was looking at lower float lower priced small cap stocks uh -huh. because it gave me the most volatility and the most room to make uh, money. And you were able to trade that using relatively little account size, right? Like Correct. with like the 2000, I don't Correct. know how much you were trading. It's with. actually exactly 2000. Yeah. So it got to the point where like, I was like, okay, like shorting is it. I found out what I'm going to do. Okay. And I ended up uh, selling the rims on my car for $2,000 to fund my trading account. The rims on your car yeah. cost two thousand dollars. Yeah, so each rim was like five hundred dollars at the oh, time. Oh, okay. So I had five hundred, five hundred, five hundred, five hundred. Sold the rims off my car. Oh, I'm sure okay. I could, I could send you a picture and you could like <laughs> pop it up on the screen. Sure. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I ended up selling the rims on my car as like my final day trading account with two thousand. I was like, you know what? If I lose this, I'm gonna quit trading forever. Really? And that's kind of that account oh. that started to get me to start to grow because now I had skin in the game. Now I, I was like, all right, like if I lose this, like can't really drive my car anymore. Like I can't really do anything. Like I'm, I'm screwed. So yeah. it was pretty much a $2,000 account that I ended up growing. And if you know, like most of your viewers, viewers know that PDT is 25,000. Yes. So I had to grow that to like 25,000 to open up 
and over the PDT account to finally start to you know, day trade consistently. So were you with, when, while you were under the PDT rule, were you really, like, how did you manage your trade so you can trade like three times yeah. a week, right? How did yeah. you? Yeah, so it's different. Back then, yeah. uh, they had a broker called SureTrader, which was an over, over oh, off the shore broker. I heard about that. Yeah, so they got shut down. So oh, I was yeah, using yeah. them for a while until they got shut down. And luckily <laughs> for me, by the time they got shut down, I was able to grow that account to 25,000 and move that oh, funds over. But that that brokerage is no longer in existence. They did like yeah. a bunch of shady stuff. So I don't really know. I'm just really lucky that I got my money out. Yeah, yeah. I did everything right. But and they were allowing like crazy leverage at the time. I think it was like six or eight times leverage. That's crazy. So with like a two thousand dollar account, you could have like sixteen thousand dollars in buying power. You know, it's a lot of money. Were you using a lot of that margin power when you're shorting? I was using a lot of margin when I started because I didn't know better. I didn't I know see. like the power okay. of margin. Like now I've realized that margin should be used to like be in like multiple different stocks rather yeah. than concentrating it in one stock. Yeah. Because if you concentrate it in one stock and the stock goes up 10%, you blew up your entire yeah, account. Yeah, exactly. You blew up your entire account. So I got to the point where like I started to, you know, really get consistency yeah. after I started to grow that over the PDT and come to like a United States broker. Cause that United States broker had more borrows available. Yeah. They had, you know, ECN rebates. Yeah. They had all these different perks and different benefits that an offshore broker doesn't need to provide you. you yeah. Know? And they're registered. So you're protected. And they're registered. I yeah. think they have, I think most United States brokers have like at least 250,000 in FDIC insurance yeah. and 500,000 like SPIC insurance or something mm. like that. So just that comfort and yeah. the accessibility of all the perks that they gave was just like, it just really helped. So you grew your account to over 25K, essentially yes. with only short selling. Yes. Oh, okay. And yeah. what kind of, were you in, you know, did you have a mentor or were you in the community or programs at a time that helped you get there? Yeah, I tried a bunch of different communities. I tried like a bunch of different things and they were all kind of like really the same. I feel like, I don't know, like it was all like, uh, you know, focus on this, focus on that, but it was all like kind of vague. You, you never really understood like what was really going on. Yeah. And I actually remember one of my biggest trades, I think I was 21 years old at the time. So I'm now about three years into my trading or two and a half years, three years into yeah. my trading. And I remember my biggest trade ever at the time was CLTX or CT, okay. CL, something like that. It doesn't, again, doesn't even trade anymore. Most of so these don't trade listed, anymore. Yeah. yeah. So if I remember correctly, I made $60,000 on that trade. And I was oh, like 21, wow. 22 years old. And that was like the biggest trade at the time yeah. for me. And back then the community that I was in had like these Las Vegas conferences. So the okay. head mentor of that community was like, listen, like you should come to this conference. Okay. You should get to like meet people and do this and that. Yeah. So I told my dad and I was like, dad, like, you know, I made all this money. I made $67,000 in one day trading. Like yeah. I want to go to this conference in Las Vegas. He's like, oh, like stock trading is like a scam. Like you're going to lose all your money. Like don't even bother. Like don't do it. Cause in 2008, my dad lost a lot of money in the, the crisis that yeah, happened. So he had crisis. money. He was not a day trader. He was like one of those like investors. You put money yeah. in Netflix, you put money in whatever. And he lost a lot of bon money in 2008. So he was like, oh, the stock market is a scam. You're going to lose all your money. You're going to lose all your money. No. Don't go. You're not going to meet these people. It's horrible. Don't go, don't go, don't go. I was like, listen, dad, like, I really like, I think I could do this. I really think I could do this. He's like, all right, if you're so convinced that you could do this, I'll come with you to Las Vegas and let me meet these people, right? Let me come and let me meet these people, okay. right? So me and my dad went to Las Vegas to this trading conference. And when we were there, there was a guy that was presenting. He's a crazy Asian man, right? He's a crazy, <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about. He's a crazy about. <laughs> Asian man, right? And he's showing, okay. he's showing his P&L calendar yeah. of making $500,000 in a month you know, $100,000 a week, like all this stuff. And my dad was like, this guy like seems like really, really smart. He's like, he seems like this is the guy that like really knows what he's talking about. Okay, whatever. When the conference ended, yeah. I approached him, bow at the time. Yes. And I was like, thank you like so much. Like you've helped me so much. Like I really appreciate like all that you do on Twitter. Like I hope that like we could stay in touch, whatever. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like cool kid, like cool. Like you're fine, like this and that, whatever. So he's just kept in touch a little bit on Twitter, yeah. started talking a little bit more, a little bit more. And then we just became friends like organically, we became friends organically. And he was really, really good at technical analysis. Yeah. And I was really, really good at fundamental analysis. So his That's strength it. was my weakness. Yeah. My strength was his weakness. So we kind of molded that together. He would help me with technicals. Yeah. I would help him with fundamentals. And we kind of like merged together. We became like trading buddies. We became trading oh. partners. And then... At the time, he was going through like a divorce. He was like really upset. So like, 
we kind of became a little bit closer just like yeah. talking and then it got to the point where we were like wait a second like we're helping each other we're both making like a lot of money we're both killing it like yeah why are we still not really happy with our like like why are we still not happy because we have all this money we're like killing it together we're doing so well together and we just really didn't feel like a lot of fulfillment we did both of you both of us together. yeah because oh he was going through a divorce and i was like really lonely like i wasn't didn't really have much friends how old were you at the time early you, 20s during this time? early 20s okay. i don't know maybe 23 maybe 24 oh. i don't know um, and this is way after this is when you become profitable you're making yes. big money and you yes. still don't feel happy i still don't feel happy at I this see. point at this point i was a high six-figure trader yeah and that to me at early 20s was a lot of money yeah That's it a, is oh, still a lot, lot of money, money. yeah a lot of money yeah so I was making all this money and like I was talking about and like he's going through his divorce. Yeah. I'm kind of lonely. I'm like single. I don't really have too many friends. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what's the point of this? Like I have all this money. Like, I don't know. Like, why am I not happy? Yeah. And then at that time was more scammers were coming up with like screen shares, oh. with like alerts, sure. with all this stuff. And we were like, wait a second. Like, why don't we just like help other people the same way that Bao helped me? So Bao was like my mentor that got me to that next level. So why don't we create something that's legit, yeah. that doesn't really scam people, that doesn't have really alerts and teaches people how to trade properly. Yeah. And that's how we created MIC. And that's how we started to find fulfillment in our lives by like yeah. helping other people find their consistency. And that was like that missing hole that was finally just like put together mm -hmm. after all that time. And the big thing is like, when you start like a community or when you start to educate people, yeah. you need to make sure that you have a strategy that works. Yes. So for us, it's actually really funny is me and Bao would make money every single morning and okay. I would stop trading. I would stop trading so that I could like just relax a little bit. Whereas Bao would trade all day long. He would trade oh. all day long because he loves trading. He loves okay. trading more than anything. So he would trade all day long and I would cut off my trading and I would start to realize that after 1030, Bao would start to slowly bleed out his money because instead of trading, he started to gamble. Yeah. He started to gamble. Because he's bored. He's bored. Yeah. Exactly. He's bored. And it's like at the casino, like the longer you stay at the blackjack table, you're not going to make more money. The casino is going to make the money yeah. back. They're going to yeah. make the money back. So by realizing that and recognizing that, we create the zombie rule, which is like stopping mm -hmm. to trade after 1030. Yeah. So these rules that Bao and I have learned through our own personal trading that helped mm -hmm. us be profitable is now what we've passed along as well. And I try to say that like, as a leader, I have to lead by example. So For I sure, stick to yeah. the rules. I stick to the process that we yeah. teach and it leads to like millions of dollars. I do want to touch upon something you said earlier. Um, even though Bao started out being your mentor, teaching you, he is good at technicals. You're good at fundamentals. Yes. So in a way, it's not just him giving you giving and you just Correct. taking. So it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. Correct. You're providing him value. He's also doing the same. So in this way, this is like a true mentorship but it's not one-sided correct yeah and that's how you guys were able to kind of you know become friends personal exactly. friends and now business partners exactly if you yeah. leech off someone after a certain point they'll be like why do i need this person but if you provide a value yeah if you do like i don't know there was like uh, when we started mic one of our uh co-founders tosh was mm -hmm. like i'll work for you for free I'll work for you for free for yeah. however long it takes. And then now, like after a certain amount of time, like he has a higher position. So yeah. it's just, if you're able to provide value to people, whether it be through helping them with something that they're struggling with or by working for free, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's so much value that is provided that yeah. it ends up benefiting you in the long term. Yeah. That's very true. Especially, I find it very true, especially in trading industry. Most traders don't make it. Yeah. And the, most traders struggle and that's fine. And they do want to go out and reach out for help. But most people just want to take. They just they ask just you take. questions like, oh, what's a float? What's the market cap? And like, Google this yourself. Yeah. Or look at one of your videos. Yeah, right? you, I, I mean, think about how many videos you have on like level two on oh float and whatever. And they're like, yeah. hey, can you teach me? Just like go to YouTube, write Search. trader and write float. Yeah. You know? I know. So that's the frustrating part yeah. a little bit um but but lazy people like that will in my opinion never find success because they're yeah. not willing to put in that work right yeah this is hard trading is hard if you want to make more money than a doctor a lawyer an engineer combined <laughs> it's it's a little bit difficult it's going to yeah. take you some time and if you're just that type of person that's like hey uh can you tell me what level two is when they don't really even do the work themselves to look into it it's almost like they are their own worst enemy yeah they're their own worst enemy yeah, it's very true. And unfortunately, those are the people, part of the 90% of people who Correct. don't make it. Correct. Yeah. 
I'm sure our audience are really curious about what your daily routine like as a trader. Can you share what yeah. the steps are with them? Sure, I'll share it beginning to end. So okay. first things first is when I was starting my trading, I would wake up at 4 a.m. I wake up at 4 a.m. every single day so that I know what stocks are moving, what news is moving, and it gives me enough time to like read the fundamentals and read the chart. Now, as I've kind of matured on my trading, I wake up around like 6 a.m. Wake up at 6 a.m. Okay. And the first thing I do, no matter what, every single day, is I have to check my phone. I check my phone, okay. the first thing I do to see like if there's any stocks on my watch list from the previous day that are moving. After I check my phone, I have to drink espresso. I have to, <laughs> I'm like a zombie in the morning. Okay. I, I cannot function without coffee in the morning. So I have my espresso, I get right up to my office. So as soon as I get to my office, put up my trading platform. And the first thing I do is I look at the top percentage gainers of the day. Okay. So I look at which stocks are gapping up the most on the day. After I look at the stocks that are gapping up the most, what mm. I do is I read the news on each stock. Sometimes a stock has news, sometimes a stock doesn't have news. Okay. If a stock doesn't have news, it's a pretty big edge because most of the time it doesn't have a catalyst to keep it up. Mm. So if a stock does have news, I'll look at the news and I'll read it and see what it sounds like. Oftentimes, a lot of people don't realize that companies PR the same thing. So yeah. I try to cross reference to see if this company has ever PR the same thing. Recycle the, the recycle headlines. It. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And based on that, that's a different level of an edge, right? Okay. So first thing is we look at what stocks gapped up. Then we look at the news. Then what I do is I look at the fundamentals of the stock. Okay. So these days there's a bunch of different tools out there to like use to help with fundamentals. I use dilution tracker okay. because they're pretty simple. Uh, look at, you know, if they have any outstanding warrants, if they have like an ATM, if they have a shelf. So I try to, get as much information on a stock as I can before I even look at the chart. Mm -hmm. So after I get that information from the fundamentals and I say, all right, this stock is gapping up. This stock has a news catalyst. This stock has, you know, something in the fundamentals or the filings that kind of looks a little bit sketchy. Then I look at the chart. And like we mentioned earlier, is the chart one of those daily charts where it wicks up and wicks down? Yeah. Or is it one of those charts that's like, you know, it looks like a breakout is about to happen. Is yeah. it like gapping? Like, how is it gapping up? Is it gapping up into previous resistance? Is it gapping up into blue skies? Or is it one of those wick up and wick down? So I depending see. on that, that's going to be something that I try to narrow down as well. If it's one of those stocks that's gapping up into all time highs, I don't want to short it. I don't want to short it because there's no previous resistance. But if it's a stock that wicks up and wicks down on day one, good. Mm -hmm. If it's a stock that's coming into previous resistance, good. Then after that, I pretty much, uh, plot out my uh, entries and exits based on support and resistance. I keep okay. it really simple. So these days, a lot of stocks are moving pre-market. And by the time you wake up pre-market, the chart is already kind of formed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I like to use those pre-market levels as my uh, potential resistance and support. So I'll just draw my resistance, I'll okay. draw my support to be able to visualize it on the chart. Now, these days, there's different pumpers, different discords, different this, different that, that are moving stocks as well. So I have friends and other people and like all these other discords that let me oh, know if people are like pumping different stocks. Okay. So pretty much, find what stocks are gapping up the most. Read the news, read the filings, look at the daily chart, draw my support and resistance. What I've realized in the world of shorting is every single day, there's usually a hot stock moving. There's a stock with tremendous volume. There's a stock that has all the attention. There's a stock that all the traders in the chat rooms and all the people on Twitter are talking about. That stock, I call the hot chick of the day. And I call it the hot chick of the day <laughs> because it's okay. I call it the hot chick of the day because if you go to a bar and the hot girl is there, all the guys are going to give her attention. Right, oh, all the girls guys. are going to give her okay. attention, and she's not going to say yes to any of those guys. She's yeah. going to dodge and dive and duck and thing, but she has a friend. Just, she's just getting the free drinks. She's getting the yeah, free drinks. She's getting it, all yeah. the attention. <laughs> but she has her friend that like may not be like as good looking, oh my God. but like she like if a guy talks to her, she's going to talk and engage and have fun and whatever. Yeah, yeah. So instead of finding the hot stock of the day, the hot chick of the day to trade that <laughs> everyone's going to lose money on, <laughs> I look for her friend, right? I look for uh -huh. the side stock, the stock okay. that may not have as much volume mm -hmm. that already came down pre-market, right? The yeah. chart is already formed pre-market and I'm basically waiting for that stock to have a bounce into pre-market resistance rather than to short, rather than looking for that hot stock that keeps making higher lows and higher lows and higher lows and higher lows and ends yeah. up parabolicking, right? Yeah. So a lot of short sellers, they have this fallacy that the higher the percentage gap is on the stock, the more I want to short it. Uh, Whereas sometimes it could just keep going and going and going because that has yeah. all the attention. Yeah. So for me, I focus on the stock that already has made a, a topping action pre-market. It's already topped out pre-market and I want to short that bounce into previous resistance. That's my bread and butter go-to setup every single day. Oh. The problem is that most short sellers, they go for that hot stock that 
kind of goes to resistance and then consolidates and shoots up. Yeah. It shoots up because it has all the volume, all the tension, all the algos, all the everything. So as mm -hmm. a short seller, I do not want to short the hot stock of the day. Yeah. I want to focus on the side stock that not as much people are watching, that doesn't have as much attention because those stocks to me have the most edge and the most capacity because there's less competition. Whereas the hot stock of the day, it's short crowded. Yeah. There's way too much competition. Yeah. So that's what's been helping me these days. So you're basically risking, in this case, in this particular strategy, are you risking around that pre-market highs area? Correct. Okay. So I've realized as a short seller that your ultimate stop, no matter what, always has to be mandatory pre-market high of yeah. the day. Because if it breaks pre-market high of the day, it has the ability to keep going. So as a short seller, no matter what, the rule, no matter what, is if it breaks pre-market high, you have to stop out. You have to stop out. Don't wait for it to see if it's going to reject. Don't wait. Don't do anything. Get the hell out if it's going against you. But what's really good is on these side stocks is the pre-market high after it's kind of made its initial move and come down. The pre-market high is so far away that like you have plenty of room to make money. Whereas oh, yeah. the hot stock of the day, it could just really relatively quickly break that and just halt up. Yeah. Right. I've been caught in so many scenarios where the hot stock of the day that was gapping up 85%, 150% goes higher and higher and higher. Yeah. Whereas a stock that gapped up 40% ended up closing red because yeah. no one focused on it. They're yeah. like, oh, like this stock is not going to do anything. Like whatever, I'm not going to touch it. I'd rather focus on this stock because I can make more money on it, but that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. So I like to focus on the stocks that are forgotten, yeah. the side stocks that people aren't really paying attention to. I also realized that since short selling became more and more popular, like you said earlier, any stocks that's trading around 80%, 90%, 100% that's able to hold around there, they tend to go higher. Yes. Because that attracts all the short sellers you were talking about and they, they get squeezed and then it goes higher. And the algos are yeah. very, like they, the algos just got way smarter. I think ever since 2020, the pandemic, I think they got so smart because yeah. in my opinion, when the entire stock market was crashing in like 2022 ish, like 2021, 2022, uh, a lot of the hedge funds couldn't make money. They couldn't make money because everything was going down. Yeah. So I think that they programmed their algos to start focusing on small cap stocks oh. to like start making up that difference in P&L that they were doing because now there's so much algorithmic trading in small caps. You could see it yeah. nonstop. The, the volume on these small cap stocks is absolutely ridiculous sometimes. And I think it's all algorithmic trading just getting smarter and smarter and smarter. If that's the case, do you think it has gotten a little bit tougher to trade small cap stocks then? Because it didn't used to be like that when the, the bigger funds or like algos were involved. So how has it changed to modern day now? I think every year trading gets more difficult. I think every year that you wait, it gets more difficult because like you think about, I mean, when we first started trading, most of the time, like I remember seeing people that would just short a stock at market open and then cover it at market close <laughs> and it would just go straight down. Yeah. That doesn't exist anymore. Or like during the pandemic, you would just buy any stock and it would just go straight up. Yeah. That doesn't exist anymore. So I think the market has a way of just getting harder and harder and harder and cycling out more people and more people and more people. But Interesting. to your point is I think that now because most people are in the short selling world, the stock squeezes that we're getting are a lot more ridiculous. Yeah. They're a lot crazier. They're a lot more uh, insane. So that actually gives veteran short sellers more of an edge because the newbie short sellers are driving these stock prices up, yeah. whereas the veterans are waiting and getting even better entries. Yeah. So I think that if you are a veteran, someone that's been doing it for a longer time, I think you have even more of an edge because there's a lot of dumb short sellers mm -hmm. driving up these stocks higher for more veteran traders to take advantage of it. Yeah. Okay. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. Okay. There was a, another trader I traded with uh, for a while. He's a really good short seller. Whenever he shorts, he's saying, yeah, wait for on the chart to see at least two blow ups from other people, like other uh, short squeeze charts. Yes. Like you can tell on the, when the stock like squeezes up and comes back down, it yeah. waits for at least two times, yeah. and the third time you short it. Yeah. So that's his strategy. He waits for the premature short sellers to get squeezed out, yeah. then he shorts when the stock actually is gonna break down, and there's no more shorts to, get, to have to cover. Yeah, that there's, yeah, there's so many different ways to make money in the market. There's mm. so many, you can skin a cat in different ways. Like for me, what I've realized on day one, avoid those hot stocks and focus on the side stocks, and yeah. day two, then you could attack that hot stock because on day two, that hot stock now becomes a side stock because now there's a new stock moving that yeah. day. So for me, day one short selling, I focus on stocks that have already topped out pre-market and are bouncing through resistance. I avoid the hot, hot stock. And on day two, the hot stock now becomes a side stock because there's a new stock moving. And that's when I could capitalize on that day one stock because 
everyone blew up on day one on that stock. <laughs> yeah. So they don't want to touch it anymore. Yeah. They don't want to touch it anymore. Whereas for me that didn't touch it, that ignored it. Now I have a pretty big edge to short it. On your Twitter, uh, you share a lot of your charts. Yes. And I noticed that you're really good at scaling into your trades. Yes. Can you kind of talk about how you position size your trades? How do you decide when to add? And uh, how do you try to maximize the best out of this one short trade? Great. So this is a really good question. So I think a big problem that people have is they think that you have to size up on every single trade. I think that's false. I think you cannot size up on every single trade. And the example okay. I give is this, and is I actually really like this. So okay. let's say we're going to make a bet and we're going to make a bet that Bao is going to get drunk. So <laughs> you win the bet if he gets drunk. Okay. okay? I'm going to give you two scenarios. Let's say me and Bao, we go to Disney World and there's like a couple beers that he gets or whatever, yeah. you know, hangs out. There's probably like a 50% chance that like he'll get drunk at Disney World, let's say. Okay. Now let's say Bao's at the club, he's got a bottle of Hennessy, there's a couple cute girls with short skirts, and they're all over him. <laughs> I would say there's a 99% chance that he's going to get drunk. Yeah. So wouldn't you always bet on those 99% of him going to the club? Wouldn't you use max size on Bao at the club yeah. rather than using max size at the Disney World example? Yeah. One has a 50% chance of winning, one has a 99% chance of winning. So I think sizing is based on the setup and the opportunity. So. Now that you understand that example, yeah. I'm going to tell you how to get it even further. So let's say on a stock that I would rate, I think each setup should be have like a rating, right? Okay. So for me, my A plus setup is a first red day. That's one of those setups that I'll bulldoze in size. That's a bow at the club setup where I know that's going to be a 90% win rate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So on a setup like that, I am using exponential amounts of size. Let's say my normal size is 10,000 shares. Okay. I'm using 100,000 shares because I have such a high win rate on that setup yeah. because of the, the odds are in my favor. Whereas something that has like, I don't know, like a B setup or a C setup, I'm only using like 10 or 20,000 shares because that probability is not as high. So number one is you have to grade your setups. If you know what grade your setup is, then yeah. you could size up depending on that setup. So depending on what that setup is, you have your specific sizing. So if someone doesn't know how to grade their setups, they're not ready for size. That's number one, mm -hmm. number one. Now, let's say you did grade your setup, you know what you're gonna use, you're gonna do whatever it is. So for me, if it's a B setup, I think the simplest thing for short sellers is just to wait for it to be under VWAP. Yeah. Because if it's under VWAP, there's resistance at top, there's yeah. a lot of supply into the stock. So that kind of gives you an example. So my rule of thumb is I only wanna use 30% of my size above VWAP. So if my max size is 10,000 shares, yeah. I want to use 3,000 shares above VWAP. And if I see like a death candle or a break under VWAP, then I'll get to my 10,000 shares. Okay. Whereas if it's a first red day setup, then I'm going to use 100,000 shares. My signal for the first red day setup is when the stock goes red, short it. So I'll oftentimes even go my full size as soon as the stock goes red, because that's when the signal is yeah. that profit taking is going to occur, that things are going to change. So sizing is based on the setup. And okay. how to size in on the stock is again, almost relatively based on the setup. But I think the simplest, simplest thing that you could do is 30% of your size above VWAP, 100% of your size under VWAP, and make sure that you are sizing exponentially based on the setup. A C setup should use 10,000 shares, a B setup should use 25,000 shares, and A setup should use 100,000 shares. Now, mm. that's not for you to use 100,000 shares on every setup, that's for you to understand the scaling, yeah. the, the, the variation of mm -hmm. size. You know, 10,000, 25,000, 100,000. Notice the A plus setup has almost 10 times as much size as a C setup. Yeah. And that's how you could exponentially make more money sizing based on the setup. So focus on grading your setup and then sizing exponentially based on the setup in front of you. Wait for that bow at the club setup and go <laughs> all in. Yeah. And if it's a bow at Disney World, don't bet as heavy. That makes a lot of sense. And also in that case, then you do have to accept the fact that for, let's say your A plus setup, most of the time it works out, but yes. when it doesn't, the loss is also exponentially higher Correct. than the risk. Correct. Yeah, that's if, the risk people have to accept. Correct. If you yeah. know that something is going to work nine out of 10 times, are you just going to shy away from it every single time? You can't. Mm. It's just odds. Yeah. Nothing is 100%. Even if you play blackjack and you have a 20, the dealer could still get a 21 and they could yeah. still win. They could yeah. still win. So that doesn't mean that you just don't do it. You have to take it. You have mm. to take that, uh, that setup because... You don't know how often it's going to come. There might be a time where, I mean, I remember during the pandemic, there was like a first red day set up every month. Whereas when the pandemic ended, it was every quarter. Mm. So it changes, it changes. And you yeah. can't just be, you can't shy away. So a lot of people are fearful of losing money in the markets. Whereas 
I think my talent is that I'm not really fearful. I'm just like, I want to maximize. I want to maximize. Yeah. I hate missed opportunity. I hate it. I hate it more than anything. So what really upsets me is if a first red day setup comes on and I don't size up big enough. I, I don't see. get big enough. That's what really pisses me off. But oh, interesting. But yeah, I think the yeah. problem that a lot of traders have, Shay, is that they are using the same size on everything. Yeah. They're using 10,000 shares on their B setup, their C setup, their A setup. Every single setup, they're using the same size. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I'm losing money on these setups and I can't seem to find consistency. I can't make money. I just make money and I lose money. I make money, I lose money. It's because you're using the same size on every single stock. That's not yeah. how it works. You have to size up exponentially based on the higher probability that certain stocks and certain patterns, certain opportunities give you. Thank you for sharing your scaling in and entry strategy. What would you do for take profit and exiting? Yeah. So what I've realized is that like a lot of people, like once they enter a stock on the short side, they set like these arbitrary price targets, right? So like, okay. let's say they short stock at $5. They're like, I know I'm just going to cover at $3. I'm going to wait. There's an offering that's going to hit and I'm going to cover at $1, right? Okay. And what I found out is that like the market doesn't care about your stupid price targets. Like you can say whatever price target you want in your head. It doesn't mean that the stock is going to get there. I think the simplest way, the way that I use is I always cover based on where is support on the chart. So if support is at $4.50, I want to take a little piece off as support. If the I next see. support is $4.25, I want to take a little piece off at $4.25. Rather than setting these targets in your head of like <laughs> an offering is going to hit or bad news is going to hit or it's going to do this, it's going to do I'm going to cover at $2 because a piece of what ends up happening is like if you never take profits off the table, stock is going to reverse. Yeah. Stock is going to reverse. So I think keep it very simple is draw your support lines on the chart okay. and always cover as support and always short at resistance. What I think a lot of people do that's like pretty screwed up is they buy resistance and they sell at support, right? They buy okay. resistance and they sell at support. Yeah. Whereas you should always be selling at resistance yeah. and buying as support. Hmm. There was one trader that I knew and all he would do is just short at resistance and buy support. Short at resistance, buy support all day long. And then there was like another trader that would just keep uh, buying at resistance because he kept trying to buy the breakout. <laughs> so it doesn't work. Okay. So if you just yeah, keep it as simple sense. as shorting resistance and covering, I know it sounds really simple, but think about it next time you're trading is, are you shorting or selling at resistance? Are you buying yeah. or covering at support? Or are you panic selling at support and panic buying at resistance? Mm. So I always use a chart chart is the simplest way to determine things so always use support as your exits if you're shorting and if you're like longing always use resistance as your sell if you keep it that simple and don't set pr like price targets in your head like for example yeah. you buy a stock at five you're like it's going to go to 15 i'm going to retire market doesn't care about your arbitrary price target but yeah. sell it at resistance or you short a stock at five it's going to have an offering go to one market doesn't care cover at support keep it simple so in that case, does it matter to you what your true risk reward is? Because sometimes the support, like I think it's a good idea to take profit as support when you're yeah. short, but I'd say it's only one to one. Would you still take it? I mean, I would take it. I, I would, the way that I think about things is not really in the risk to reward type of ratio. Okay. I think about it in the grade of the setup and the probability ratio. So I think about it in terms of how, what is the percentage probability that this setup is going to work and what is that grade on that setup? That's kind of more so how I determine it rather than using the risk reward because I think it could be too like, I, I don't know, it just like it never worked for my trading. I, I know a lot of people that use it and it helps them a lot, but for yeah. me, it just, it just doesn't work. It's too complicated for me. I'd rather right. just like keep it really simple. So you don't do, I know there are people who like crunch spreadsheets, they like track no. numbers. You don't do that? Too much work. Okay. So you are, does that mean you are more of a discretionary yes. trader and that yeah. works for you? It's because for me, like when yeah. I started trading, I wanted to do... I, I like to be efficient, right? Yeah. I like less is more. So like trading is also based on your personality. Like, mm -hmm. like Bao is like, I think of him as like an octopus. He's like, he's, he's he likes to have his tentacles all over the place, right? He's <laughs> yeah. like a little bit erratic. So he has, he has each of his eight tentacles and eight different stocks at the same time. Whereas okay. for me, I'm more um, conservative and I'm more efficient. So rather than Bao using, you know, 10% size on 10 different stocks, I use 100% size on one stock because if I'm oh, able to I focus see. on one stock, all my attention is on one stock. Whereas if Bao's trading, you know, five stocks, he has 20% attention here, 20% attention there, 20% attention there, 20% attention there, 20% attention. You don't have enough attention on all the stocks, so you may miss certain things, but that's his personality. His personality yeah. is he likes to be in everything, whereas my personality is less is more. So I like to focus all my attention on one stock yeah. and spreadsheets and number crunching is too complicated for me. So I'd rather just keep it simple. 
Mm. Keep it really simple is what works for me. Because I know a lot of traders are like, okay, I do data, I do this, I do yeah. that. And it's good to help you determine what is your A setup, your B setup, your C setup. But after you know what setups you are the most profitable on, after you know the probability of those setups, it's just a matter of waiting for those setups to come so you can repeat it. I doesn't, I, if I keep crunching numbers right now, I know that the first red day is my best setup. I know that shorting into resistance is an 80, 90% win rate. Yeah. I know all these things. So I don't need to do it at this level. I see. But when I first started, I did a little bit just to determine what works now. But for now, mm -hmm. as I'm, you know, 10 years into my trading, yeah. I don't need to crunch any more numbers. I already know what works, you know? Obviously you're, yeah, you're more seasoned now and yeah. you're experienced. I think, I think for newer traders, they do need to do a little bit more of those journaling work to get to where and you are, they have, to understand. And these days they have like trader view. All you yeah. have to do is upload your trades. Yeah. When I first started, I uploaded my trades. I found out my win rate. I found out which stocks I make the most money on. I found out mm. everything. And all you really need to do is just get a data set of just like, I don't know, maybe like a year or two years of trading yeah. and put it all in there. And then you'll have all the answers. And really, realistically, you don't have to do it again because you know what you have to work on. Mm. You know what you have to work on. Like I found out that I lost the most money after 10.30 a.m. Okay. I lost the most money going long on stocks and I lost the most money on stocks over $20 a share. So by eliminating stocks over $20 a share, by eliminating trading after 10.30, I was able to increase p &L. It seems like you really understand the way you trade. Like yeah. you, it seems like to master trading, you have to understand yourself. Yeah. Yeah, you have to understand your personality, uh, what you like, what you don't like, and uh, where you tend to mess up. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know my biggest problem as a trader is I get too greedy. I get too greedy and I oversize sometimes, right? Yeah. I oversize. So my biggest problem in my trading is I get too excited. I get too excited if I see an A-plus opportunity. Yeah. If I see a bow at the club or a first red day <laughs> setup, that I get in too big too early. So that's my biggest problem right now in my trading is I get too oversized. Yeah. I get too oversized. So that's something that I'm working on now. And like we mentioned a little bit earlier, is I've been sizing down to help combat that as well, you know? Oh, but you have see. to, trading is a matter of finding your strengths and weaknesses as a person and as a trader. So my strength as a trader, I would say is discipline, stock selection, and my ability to like push hard when the opportunity is there. My weakness is that I get too greedy, yeah. I have too much FOMO, and I get in too big. We just heard some very powerful insights on trader psychology from Alex. Now my question is for you. What kind of trading mistakes have you been doing that's holding you back from becoming profitable? And how are you going to address them from now on? Let me know in the comment section below. So do you mind sharing your, what, what some of your biggest wins and your biggest loss? Sure. So let's start with the biggest loss. Sure. So my biggest loss was actually a few months ago. I lost $450,000 on TOP. Oh, and okay. <clears throat> the reason why I lost on that, I used way too much size. Was that like a, one of those Chinese stocks yes. that's super low float? So let me tell you what okay. happened. So I missed, you know, all these Chinese IPO scams. They all went to, I missed every single one of them. Like every, HKD every or that. Every single one of them I did not touch. I <laughs> so missed it. FOMO. I, did, I was like, this is the one that I'm going to nail. I'm okay. going to bulldoze in size. I'm going to go big. I'm going to make a million dollars on this trade because I saw so many other traders making so much money on these Chinese scams. Yeah. I was like, this is the one for me. This is the one. <laughs> So I oversized on the front side. Okay. I used way too much size, way too much size. And I ended up stopping out for a massive $450,000 loss. And I stopped out around like, I don't know. I think I stopped out around like 20 or 25. And oh, it wow. To, you stopped out early too. And it went That's to good. 200. I would have lost $10 million. Oh, jeez. I lost $10 million if yeah. I was stubborn. So that was my biggest loss. And that came from oversizing. Yeah. So that was 100% oversizing. That was the worst loss I've had because, again, I was emotional because I missed all the other Chinese scams. Yeah. I had FOMO. And I was like, this is the one that's going to make me so much money. And I was oversizing. So the three cardinal sins of my trading, all my biggest weaknesses came together in one stock. Mm. All my biggest weaknesses yeah. came together in one stock and I got destroyed, $450,000. So that was also right off the bat of me having some of my best consistency ever. So... I was a little bit overconfident because of how consistent I was because this year uh, I started a, I don't know if you saw, but I started, started a $30,000 account challenge okay. where like I started an account with 30,000 and see how far I could grow it. And I grew that $30,000 account into a million dollars in 55 days. Mm. It was the craziest thing ever. It was the best thing ever. So like when I made 30,000 to a million in 55 days, 
I was so confident. I was like, <laughs> I got so much money in my account. Yeah, yeah. Because like, I I like to do a challenge at the at the beginning of the year, just like make it a little bit more fun. So that was my challenge. And what I used to do is every time that I got my account from thirty thousand to fifty thousand, I would wire out fifteen thousand as a paycheck. Okay. I'd wire out a paycheck. This time I didn't do it. Okay. I didn't do it. So my account was just. 100,000, 200, 500 million dollars. So I had a million yeah. dollar account just chilling there and I broke my rule of not wiring out. I so see. I had all this money in my trading account. I had all this buying power and I just pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and it ended up eating me in the face because I was too overconfident from all of my past wins this year. Yeah. I had too much ego, too much greed and everything. And that taught me a really valuable lesson is number one, I never want to have so much money in my trading account that I could lose. And number two is I really have to control my oversizing and I have to make sure that I size up on the backside and not just because I have FOMO that yeah. this is going to be the one. So that was my biggest loss and that happened this year. My biggest win ever was, I would say, so in terms of in a single day, it would probably be AMC. I made the most okay. money shorting AMC. I, if I remember correctly, I was shorting it around seventy dollars, oh, wow. and I ended up covering around thirty dollars in the same day. That was the day that it had the big ATM offering. Yeah. So that was also a first red day setup for me. Oh, okay. So that was about I made about seven hundred. A plus plus. That was an A plus plus, yeah. and I made about seven hundred thousand dollars that day. Nice. Biggest trade ever. But my biggest ticker overall is probably Bed Bath and Beyond. Oh, BBBY. I probably made, I probably made probably over a million dollars, like in terms of like different times adding up. I think just this year I made 700 grand on it, like over multiple, multiple times. Gotta love um, those meme stocks. My, the meme, I've, yeah. I actually went back through my trading and the meme stocks is where I made all my money. I made a lot of money on meme stocks. Oh, was, on the short side. On right? the short yeah. side. Like the most, my biggest winners have been the meme stocks. So AMC is probably like 700,000 in a day and probably like overall, probably like 850,000 in terms of like adding other trades. Bed Bath & Beyond is close to a million and I was at GameStop is like probably half a million. So probably mm -hmm. just on those three tickers, about two and a half million. So, but those tickers are no longer in the small cap realm. Mm -hmm. So you do kind of go outside of those. They start off parameters. as like the small caps and yeah. they kind of evolve due to short squeeze into those different realms. Yeah. Those um, meme stocks, right? They were both in 2020 and 2021. Um, and then a little bit earlier this year yes. as well. And during those years, you're able to push size. I think all their, all, most of the traders I know had the best years in those times, yes. those years. How, how do you adapt and how do you feel about the current market? Because obviously volume has since then dropped yeah. off quite a bit, yeah. right? We don't get those multi-day runners with really high volumes yeah. anymore. Yeah. How do you adapt when volume dries out? How do you adapt and stay nimble when it's not in your market com uh, ideal market condition? Yeah, I mean, so I know you say that a lot of people made a lot of money during the pandemic. And yeah. my biggest regret in my trading is I didn't get bigger. That's my biggest regret is I didn't get bigger. Because back then, you know, I'd be making $20,000 in a day. Yeah. And I'd be like, that's it. I'm good. I'm going to go walk away and enjoy my day. But I could easily push for $50,000, $60,000. I could have made millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars during that time. But I ended up not realizing how big of an opportunity it was. So I was yeah. making really good money, but I didn't really realize until after how how abundant that opportunity was. So I actually uh, am making it my goal to, so that when that next type of euphoric market happens, yeah. it may happen in five years, may happen in 10 years, I don't know when it's gonna happen, but when it happens, I'm gonna push like crazy because that is the time to make money. So actually my biggest regret is not making more money during that time yeah. because of how easy it was. Because I didn't know. I didn't know how yeah. easy it was. I don't think anyone has seen a market like that. Yeah, the only yeah. comparable thing is 2000. And mm. we were in trading in the year yeah. 2000. Bao has seen that. Bao has right? seen it. Yeah, Bao yeah. has seen it, right? <laughs> Bao has seen it. So like, if we think about logically, maybe the next time it's going to come is 10 or 20 years. I don't know if I'm going to be able to still be trading or what's going to be going on around that time. But I know that my biggest regret is not going in bigger when that happened. Now, as you know, the market has changed since then. Yeah. Everything has been totally different. And in my opinion, the market has kind of equalized. And by that, I mean all those people that made crazy money in 2021 or uh, in 2020 or 2021 yeah. probably lost it all in 2022. Guaranteed, they lost 90% yeah. of those traders, lost all their money because they what they were doing is now not working. They did not know what risk management was. They did mm. not know what hard stops were, so they ended up losing their money. Yeah. So in these current market environments, I think the best thing that you could do is just size down and be a little bit more patient for higher probability setups because a lot of people are looking for the same type of short squeezes that were happening during the pandemic 
but we technically can't get those short squeezes because there's not as much market participants anymore. Mm. A lot of those market participants got flushed out and they yeah. blew up and there's no stimulus money coming into the market anymore. So I think that a lot of that dumb money that came in has been gone. So mm. I think it's actually a little bit more difficult now because the only people that are left are smart traders and the algos. Yeah. And it's very hard to compete against smart traders yeah. and the algos. We want more, more yeah. people that are on stimulus checks, more yeah. people that are gambling right? So the market's definitely gotten hard. That doesn't mean that you can't make money. It's just a little bit tougher to make money because there's not as much opportunities. Mm. Whereas during the pandemic, we had three, four, five, six stocks moving every single day. Now we have one stock moving or two stocks moving. Yeah. So there's more competition from smarter sure. people that makes it harder. Yeah. Let me ask you a follow-up question. In that case, do you think trading is a zero-sum game? In what way? Because like you said, right, for uh, experienced traders who make a lot of money, there has to be an influx yes. of dumb money. So yeah. when they no longer exist, it's harder to make money because in some ways you need those dumb money to be very, yeah. you know, careless with their trades yeah. for a lot of big traders to make money. Yeah. Like the meme stocks, you know, all the hype, right? So do you think that makes trading, day trading stocks a, a, a zero sum game? I like someone has to lose for you to make money. Yes, that's mm. that. That's the way the market is designed. Yeah. The market is designed that someone always wins and someone always loses. Yeah. There's a guy that's always buying Tesla at 400 and a guy that's selling Tesla at 400. There's a guy that's buying Tesla at 100 and selling it at 100, right? Mm. So if you think about it logically, like when the entire market crashed and like I use Tesla as an example because like it's a stock that a lot of people are relatively yeah. familiar with. Tesla went from like, I don't know, like $300 to $120, right? Yeah. So someone had to sell Tesla at $120 for someone else to buy at $120. So whoever sold it at $120, now as we're recording this, I think it's at like $250 or whatever the stock price is at. So that guy's like, God damn, like I sold it too soon. Whereas <laughs> the guy that bought it is like, I'm a genius. Yeah. So someone always has to lose for another person to win. And I also think that trading becomes a lot easier if there's more dumb money involved. So yeah, for sure. When all those newbies and all those people came in, I mean, like, I don't know if you've ever played video games, but like in Call of Duty, there's like a saying called like the Christmas noobs because all the parents get their kids Call of Duty for Christmas. Okay. And all those kids are brand new, uh, they're brand new uh, players and they're very easy to kill in the game. Oh they're, they're called Christmas noobs. Oh, so like okay. every time Christmas comes along, you could kill a lot of these people in Call of Duty and level oh up and God. do all this stuff. The same thing in trading is like I the see. stimulus noobs. They come into the market makes and you clean up, right? <laughs> so it doesn't mean that it's impossible to make money trading. Yeah. It just means that when there's that influx of dumb money, it's a lot easier to make money trading. That makes sense. It's also a little bit sad. Too. It's sad, but yeah. like that was us when we first started. Think yeah. about our first year. Someone yeah. else was like profiting off us our first yeah. year because like we didn't know. We were buying the breakout, whereas this other guy was shorting the breakout, right? Yeah, so it's sure. just, it's linear. It's linear. I think in some ways, every new trader has to go through that cycle of, okay, I'm really dumb in my first year, I'm losing money, I'm getting taken advantage of, but you can, if you can like hold your ground and be able to survive through that first year of yeah. you learning the ropes, eventually you're gonna be, come, be able to come ahead on the other side. It takes time. Yeah, I mean, if I, look at it, if I look at it now, I don't know what the hell I was thinking, still trading for three years when I wasn't making money, but I was passionate yeah, about it. Yeah, you pushed through it. I was passionate, I really liked it. I, trading became like my entire life. I would consume trading videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'd be watching the Wall Street movies. Like uh, I was really interested in that world. So yeah. that passion helped me be able to like push through the, um, the adversity that trading yeah. provides. And if you're not totally in love with trading, it'll be really hard to push through those tough times. One thing I realized recently is that, oh, if I can trade, I can do almost anything. Yeah. Like there's not a lot of things that's as difficult as trading, in my opinion. Besides parenting, but those are <laughs> that's what a lot of the, the the fathers who are trading tell me. But I have yet to find out. I'm not ready for that anytime soon. <laughs> not anytime soon. So for now, the biggest difficulty is just trading. Yeah. You mentioned that nowadays, even though you're technically full-time trading, you're only trading for like an hour a day. Yeah. Right. So in a way, you are part-time trading, just like when you first started, yes. right? So what was your schedule like when you first started to be able to trade part-time while handling your Starbucks job? Yeah, so I, I was very lucky that I was working the night shift at Starbucks. Oh, so I was I able to trade in the morning yeah. during you know market hours of 9.30, 10.30, whatever. And then I would yeah. go to my job at four. 
and I'd be there all night. So okay. to me, I had the benefit of working like the night shift. Yeah. Whereas a lot of other people, depending on their time zone, a yeah. lot of them, like for example, like in California, the market opens up at 6.30 in the morning. So a lot of people could trade from 6.30 to like, I don't know, 7.30, 8.30 yeah. in the morning, then go to their day job at nine. So I think the time zone really matters, but also like, I know like we have members in MIC. We have one guy who's like a truck driver. So mm -hmm. as he's like driving his truck, he's trading. Oh my God. We have like another guy. <laughs> we have another guy who is a doctor. So yeah. like in between like his patients, he's like going in and like oh trading too. Or we have another guy who um, is like in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. So he like runs to the bathrooms, like trade on his phone or like something like that. So I think that if you want to make it work, you can make it work yeah. and you should use the time zone and the timing to your advantage if you can. And what kind of tips do you have for those part-time traders who are, you know, making those resources work and trying to grind it through that first year? Do you yeah. have any tips for them? Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing is that like there's certain time periods in the market day where there's more advantage, like more advantages to trade. Like okay. I think the market open is the most advantageous. That's where I make most of my money is the market open. Whereas yeah. the middle of the day, the lull is like choppy anyway. So it's better yeah. that you don't trade during the chop. So if my advice would be if you have a part-time job, whatever you're doing, just try to see if you could cut off enough time to like trade the first hour of the day. If you have enough time to trade from like, I would say at minimum, minimum 9 a.m. to like 10.30 a.m. Okay. or 11 a.m., maybe two hours. Like if you have that window, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. you could do to get that window, that should be enough time to capitalize on the most amount of money you can make because the market open is the biggest advantage is the biggest edge always the middle of the day is always chop and mm -hmm. the end of the day is kind of like random too into power hour and all that stuff so i would say the first hour is the most important hour so whatever you okay. gotta do either it's wake up early change your hours or go to the bathroom while yeah. you're trading just make sure you have enough time for that hour because the problem is i like people are like, all right i'm only available to trade from 2 to 3 p.m well, if you're only available yeah, 2 to 3 p.m., tough. that's the worst possible time to make money. Yeah. It's the worst, but you can't make money. It is. It's tough. So be resourceful, right? Move your schedule if needed. Yes. And if you're on the West Coast, just wake up early. Wake up earlier. Yeah. Wake up I, earlier. I think um, the night shift idea is a really good idea. Yes. Yeah. It helps. Every little bit helps. Every little bit helps. So I do want to take a step back and kind of talk about something you mentioned earlier, where you said... You made so much money. You were a six-figure trader at the time, and you were still not happy. Yeah. And I also remember earlier in our conversation, you said you got into trading because you want to become so rich that your ex-girlfriend would be, <laughs> you know, like regret breaking up with Correct. you. Correct. So I think it is a little interesting that you did achieve that, but that didn't bring you fulfillment, right? Do you find that that's because of your age, because obviously you're still really young, and back then you were even younger, and you made so much money at such a young age. Did you have like an existential crisis? Yeah, and I mean, I'm still struggling with that today, right? Because it only gets, you only make more money, and that, yeah. that feeling only gets a little bit more exponential, right? So for me, I think what I, what I didn't realize at the time, which I realize now, is that money is a tool to help you find and help you do what makes you happy, right? Yeah. A lot of people think that money buys happiness and in a certain way it kind of does, right? In a certain way it kind of does, but if your focus is just making money and making money and making yeah. money, you'll never be able to make enough money because there's always gonna be someone that has more money. Yeah. Always, always, no matter what, right? You, you have a Rolex, you wanna buy an AP. You have a Ford, you want to buy a Ferrari. You buy a Ferrari, someone has a Bugatti. Yeah. You buy a Bugatti, someone has a plane. And then someone has a bigger plane. And then that guy has a boat. And then some guy has a bigger boat. And then they have five houses and then six houses. It never ends. There's always going to be true. someone that has more money, right? No yeah. matter what. So if you're chasing the money, eventually after a certain point, you're going to become really sad because you're never going to get to the point of making so much money that like someone else is going to have uh, less than you. The only way mm -hmm. is if you become like an Elon Musk, which 99.99999% yeah. of people are not going to become that. And even Elon doesn't do it for the money, right? Yeah. He just, money is the byproduct. So in my opinion, money should be a tool to get you to what makes you happy. What makes me happy is I love cars. So money is a tool to get me more cars because that that's what makes me happy. It's not just mm -hmm. because I want to have the fastest car. It's because for me, after a tough day of trading, getting in a really nice car and driving around kind of humbles me back down and says, wait a second, like everything is fine. Like you're doing great. You're yeah. able to earn this or whatever, or like a watch. Like I buy watches as 
memories for certain occasions or certain yeah. things that happen in my life just as like a memory. So I like that. I like travel. So you have to find what you really like in life. Like my little brother loves cooking, right? He loves cooking, loves food. So like going out to eat with him is like something yeah. that brings me happiness. So money is a tool to help you do things that make you happy. But if you're looking for money, if you're looking for happiness solely through money, you will end up being upset because people always have more money than you. Yeah. So use money as something to make you happy. It's like, what makes you happy? Like, what do you, what do you like, Shay? Like, what brings you happiness? Is it travel? Is it like going out to eat? Like, what brings you happiness? And whatever that is, yeah. use money to be able to get to that point of happiness rather than letting happiness come to money. Yeah. Let that thing that makes you happy be that, you know? Yeah, it's very interesting. The, I think when all the traders started out, Obviously, most people who start trading, you know, we, we want to make more money and that's the goal. But once most of the, those traders who make it there, they no longer think money is the only thing that matters. Like Correct. you just said, like at the end of the day, it's digits on your screen. Correct. Right? It's not, it's very hard to appreciate just the digits because it's not tangible. It's on your screen and you literally just click a few buttons literally, and that's it. Literally. Right. So it, it's hard to kind of understand the true value of it and you don't appreciate it as much yeah. anymore. I would say when you start trading, uh, and this is just, everyone's really different, but I yeah. would say when you start trading, when you go from like zero to a hundred thousand, you're like, all right, yeah. like I got it. Like I'm it's starting to make sense. Like I'm a trader. And then you go from making a hundred thousand to a million. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, like now I'm rich. Like now I have a mm -hmm. lot of money. Like now it's time to like get to the next level. After you go from one million to like two million to like five million, then you start to say like, "This is a lot of this is a lot of money." Like, yeah. I don't know what the hell to do it. And then you get to ten million. And then yeah. when you get to ten million, you're like, "Wait a second, this is like, this is like too much money, right?" Yeah, like and you then, don't. Nobody really needs that. It's much. too much. And then yeah. the problem is to like level up over ten million. It requires you to like make trading your entire life, yeah. right? It requires you to do the daily review, the daily mm. report card, to not go out, to not drink, to not yeah. do anything to get to that level. And for me, I thought that I want to be like a, I thought I want to be like a 10, $20 million a year trader. Cause like, fuck, it's a lot of money. And like, that'd be really nice, yeah. you know? But as I've kind of matured in my trading journey, I've started to realize that like making a couple million dollars a year is pretty freaking good. Yeah. Like, especially for like trading an hour a day. Like yeah. most of the time I trade from like 9.30 to 10.30. And the reality is if you make $4,000 a day, you make a million dollars a year. You know, there's been plenty of days I make more than that. And to me, like I got to that point where I was making like one, two, three million dollars a year. And I was like, all right, like now I want to get to 10, 20 million a year. And then I thought to myself, like, is it really worth sacrificing all going out to eat, having fun with my yeah. girl, doing all this stuff to get to making more money. And I kind of realized, I guess I would say like this year, after almost nine years of trading, that I'd rather make less money, less money is relative, right? I'd rather, instead of trying to make 10 million, I'd rather mm -hmm. make two, three million. I'd rather make less money. Yeah. I would rather trade for less time, use less size, and focus on, again, finding things that make me happy. Mm -hmm. So rather than devoting my entire life to trading to become that 10, 20, $30 million yeah. trader when I don't really even need that type of money, I'd rather just trade for an hour a day, make my million dollars and enjoy my life. Yeah. So actually this year, we actually talked about it on our podcast is I've actually scaled down my size. Yeah. I scaled down my size dramatically. I'm not trading as aggressively as I am anymore because I don't want to feel stressed anymore in my yeah. trading. I don't want to feel like I have to devote my entire life to trading. And now I kind of treat trading as like my part-time job. Mm -hmm. I wake up in the morning, I trade for yeah. a couple hours, and then I call it a day. That's a very good question to ask because uh, for you, the answer is no. You don't want to give up your life to, yeah. to, to make trading your entire life. Yes. For some people, they may want to do that, and I think yes. that's fine. But they, I think they do have to at least understand the consequences of that. Correct. Eventually you won't have the time, energy, and the mind space to enjoy Correct. the profits you made. Correct. Yeah. So for me, I, for me, I, I yes, I, I got drunk into trading from the Lamborghini ads. Sure. Yeah. But <laughs> for me, I re also realized something similar to you pretty soon that I don't need to make a lot of money to be happy. Correct. For me, what it means to be rich, is when I go to Chipotle, you know, you have to add like $2 for guacamole. Guac, extra chicken, extra <laughs> yeah, meat. Yeah, yeah, I used to have to think about that yeah. when I was working my regular nine to seven. Yeah. And nowadays, okay, like when I know I can just add whatever I want. Yeah. I, I, same as like ramen, you add extra sure. like pork. 
it'll be at eight dollars yeah that's but, freedom that's yeah what, that's now what Bao it's like too. that's all i need that's yeah. what Bao says too he's like the moment i realized i was rich is when i could go to a restaurant and not look at the price tag mm. that, and order whatever i want yeah and that's really powerful because like if you think about it like think about it logically and i've done the calculations in my head so many times oh you like, did i've done it so many times like <laughs> all right how many nice watches do you really need maybe two or three okay. how many nice cars do you really need maybe two or three you need maybe one nice house and you need yeah. maybe three four vacations a year all that is not that much money if you really really think about it if you really think about it, it's not that much money and then after you have that do you really need a plane not really <laughs> do you really need a boat not really you can rent one you can rent it yeah you that's, rent it. that's rent money it. enough you know it's, it's it's a lot cheaper you buy a plane for a couple million dollars you have to pay five hundred thousand dollars to maintain yeah. it every year or you could charter it for 10 grand you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, if you really think about it, a lot of people are like, I want the Ferrari, I want the Lamborghini, yeah. I want the Bugatti, I want this. And then if you get to the point of having it and then you get it, then what? Yeah. Then what? I think there's like a saying, like, uh, I don't know what the exact uh, reference is, but like once you climb Mount Everest and you do what you did, now what's left? And that mm. kind of brings you sadness, right? Yeah, that kind of brings you does. sadness. So if you're just keep focusing on that next material thing, and I, I don't, I don't, uh, joke i love having material things just as like memories and trophies for my success yeah because it reminds you of how much hard work i put in but after a certain point you run out of shit to buy you run out of shit <laughs> to buy and then after you run out of shit yeah. to buy then what are you going to really do you're going to buy another car that you already had it, it doesn't yeah. really make sense so like what i try to do is like like we just spoke about before we started like i went to paris i went to monaco yeah. i was traveling i'm trying to i'm trying to really enjoy my life because i've spent almost 10 years just working my ass off and getting to this point. Mm -hmm. And I've realized that if I want to get to that next level trading, I have to sacrifice a lot and I'm not ready for it. I'm yeah. not ready for that sacrifice. And I've met so many traders that I've met at least two traders that have made over $50 million or maybe even more. Call it, I've actually met three traders now that I'm thinking about that have made over $50 million mm -hmm. in their trading career. One of them is retired. Okay. doesn't want to trade anymore. He's sick okay. of the stress. He doesn't want to do anything. Another guy wants to get to a billion dollars and oh, that's his okay. thing. Let him do that. He's on that track. Okay. And then another trader just wants to see how good he could get. Mm. He, he, his, his number one focus is how hard could he push to see how big he could get. Okay. So these are three different types of people. I don't really care about a billion. Mm -hmm. I don't really care about seeing how good I could get. Yeah. I'm more in the mindset of this guy that's like, you know what? I've made my money trading. Yeah. It's very stressful if you want to swing big size and make millions of dollars. Yeah. And I'm kind of in that, you know, pulling back phase of being like, you know what? Pretty much in my sleep. There's certain trades that you know that in your sleep you can make a thousand dollars. I know for mm -hmm. a fact there's certain trades I can make a thousand dollars with my eyes closed, with my hands tied behind my back. Yeah. But the problem is as traders, it's never enough. It's never enough. Yeah. It's never enough. Mm -hmm. So rather than trying to say, you know what? I'm gonna make 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 a day. Let me go back to those trades where I can make $1,000 a day with my hands tied behind my back, mm -hmm. make a quarter million, a million, whatever that number is, and just enjoy my life, and yeah. enjoy it. It's very interesting because I also went to the conference in Vegas last year, and there were, there's many, a lot of really good traders attending, but what surprised me the most was that everyone who I later found out they age, their age, they're all a lot younger yes. than they actually look. Because yes. trading is very stressful. Yeah. Like I, 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 I'm actually like... <laughs> you don't see my white hairs? Yeah, I know, I see. <laughs> my white hairs on my beard. See, like it stresses yeah. you. Uh, it's, yeah. it's hard. So I think that's also something that our viewers and I you know I, I've been thinking a lot about, like how hard do I want to push this? Do yeah. I want to look fit 40? when I'm only 30? Yeah. Do I want to look 50 when I'm only 40? Like saying, yeah. th those are serious questions. Like everyone has a lot of wrinkles and like white yeah. hair. And yeah. It's a stressful job. Yeah, it's a stressful job, yeah. but it just depends on what tier of trader that you want to be. Like yeah. I thought I wanted to be that $10 million trader until I realized how much work it really is. Whereas now I'm at the point where I can make consistently seven figures relatively simple because yeah. I've been doing it for so long, right? Because I've been doing it for so long. So rather than trying to push and push and push, I'm now stepping back and stepping back and stepping back and focusing more on happiness through mm. less stress rather than happiness of trying to get that next big six figure win, which yeah. as you know, it's like, it doesn't really, like, after a certain amount of time, like the wins never feel as good yeah. as the losses feel bad. Yeah. So I keep chasing these wins that are supposed to make me feel good, which don't make me feel like anything. And then the losses that end up happening just by byproduct of trading end up making me feel like really mm. like 
I don't know. I remember like recently that there was a stock movie, you know, AI, the ticker AI. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I shorted that and I had an awesome day. I made a hundred thousand dollars. I made a hundred thousand dollars in one day and I was like, whatever. And then like the next day or like two days later, I lost like 10 grand on like some other <laughs> thing. And I was like really pissed. I was like, this is so stupid. How can I be this stupid that I am literally, I don't give a f- about a hundred thousand, right. but 10,000 pisses me off. Yeah. So you get to that point where like the losses are always going to feel worse than the wins feel good. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Do you have family or tr- friends who trade as well, who can kind of relate to you um, in real life? No family. I have mm-hmm. friends that uh, are trading through like Twitter that I met like okay, throughout yeah. the years, but now my roommates have seen how much money I make trading. So I'm actually teaching them how to trade. Oh, so I'm teaching my, wow. So one of my roommates is, has been paper trading for six months and is now live trading for a year. And now he's like consistently making like 20 or $30 a day, okay. which is really good. Yeah. He's, max size is like 500 shares. Okay. He's using 100 shares a day. So with 100 shares, he's making like 20, 30 bucks. Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. My other roommate is now paper trading for four months and he's ready to go live trading. Oh. So he's going to start live trading soon. So one uh, roommate is live trading, slowly making money. But the best part is this has been trading for a year and he's been paper trading for four months. Okay. So already in a year, my roommate is now finding a little bit of consistency, whereas it took me over three years, over yeah. three years. So the learning curve has been significantly dropped down mm. because all the mistakes that I made of like, not having a max size, yeah. not having a max loss, not doing this, not doing that. They've learned from day one. Yeah. And those lessons took me years to learn. Do you have any uh, messages uh, or advice you want to give to our viewers watching this? Any final yeah. thoughts? I have a lot of advice because I made every single mistake that you could possibly imagine. Yeah. So number one is make sure to set a max loss with your broker auto liquidation. And the way okay. that you set that is, let's say you're making $100 a day trading. Yeah. Your max loss, auto liquidation at the broker level should be no more than two days worth of trading. So it should be, if you make $100 a day, your max loss should be 200. That way you never lose more than two days worth of work. Yeah. Whereas other people, they set their max loss at like a thousand. All of a sudden they lost two weeks worth of yeah. work. It doesn't make sense. So number one is set your max loss auto liquidation at two days of your normal day. Mm. Number two is set your max size. So set a max position size on your account. The best way to do it is like, I mean, everyone has different equations, but yeah. like usually like a fifth of your equity. So like whatever okay. your equity is divided by five, that should be your max size, max size, max size. Mm-hmm. Uh, number three is use hard stops, hard market stops. Okay. When I first started trading, I didn't know what stops were. I, no one taught me. I had to figure it out on yeah. myself. I would manually do it. And every <laughs> single time I'd be a deer in headlights, I'd freeze. I'd be like, yeah. I'm going to stop out at $5. All right. You don't really now follow it. Now it's like 510. Shit. And then it's like 520. Okay, like if it goes back down to 510, and then all of a sudden it halts up to six and I'm dead. Yeah. Right? So use hard market stops. If you use a limit stop, you're not gonna get executed. Yeah. Um, aside from that, is you have there's like a lot of communities and like a lot of chat rooms out there, and a lot of them are like frauds and like con con artists. Mm-hmm. So like make sure you find a community that not only the head trader is profitable, but the students are also profitable too. Yeah. Because the head trader can make money all day long, but can he teach other people how to make money? That's a question. Yeah. Also make sure that like, I mean, I have my broker statements on my website, like the IRS mm-hmm. broker statement, so that I wanna prove to people that like it's legit. So make sure that people, like you see the broker statements from mm-hmm. people as well. And then on top of that is like, once you also have money trading, make sure you diversify it. Make sure you put it into other places because Like I said, with the example on top, I had a million dollars in my account and I was prone to losing it. Had I just stuck to my rule of wiring out $15,000, I would have built my bankroll a little bit more this year. That would have been like, all right, like whatever. Like I'm not going to risk that much money on that stock. So for me, the way that I diversify is like I buy watches, cars. I'm in a couple like venture capital funds. I do real estate, I treasury bills. I buy like long-term stocks like Apple, Tesla, stuff like that. But I diversify my money outside of the market so that God forbid, if I'm having a bad month trading, the treasury bills will make up for it. The, the investment in stocks will make up for it. The venture capital will make up for it. Like I have different avenues so that a lot of people, I think what they do is like once they make money trading, they just keep their trading accounts big and big and big, but yeah. like, it's too much risk. Yeah. It's too much risk. So I think once you make money trading, give yourself a paycheck and diversify. And the rule that I did is $30,000 account, a uh, $35,000 account, if it goes to 50000 wire out 15000 hmm. Take that 15000 
10,000 of it, invest it however you want. Yeah. 5,000, keep it in the bank. Oh, so I whatever see. whatever you want to invest. I don't know if you want to yeah. buy, like, it could be anything. I mean, yeah, yeah. even like, even handbags are <laughs> growing, going yeah, up Birkin value. Bags. Birkins are going yeah. up in value, big time. You have watches, you have bags, you have venture, you have real estate, you have stocks, you have uh, treasuries, you have crypto, you have everything that you could put your money in to kind of get you there. Just like put it outside the market. Yeah. Put it in different places so that on a rainy day, you'll be able to make sure that you have a nest egg yeah. prepared for yourself just in case, God forbid, something happens. Because if you have all of your eggs in your trading basket, too much risk. Yeah, I, I've come to realize that as a trader, we are the number one threat yes. to our trading account. Imagine. Because we're humans after all, we're dumb. So imagine you had all of your net worth in your trading account and one HKD, one top, one yeah. whatever came around. All that 10 years of work you put is gone in one day. Yeah. So make I, I have my accounts to the point where like, again, these days I'm keeping my account at like, 45, 50,000, because you really don't need much more to trade small caps. You really don't need much more. And yeah. I'm, now I'm going back to the basics of just wiring out and wiring out and wiring, because that's what got me to be profitable. Yeah, Pulling out that money and having that security in my bank account allowed me to not feel like I had to trade every day to make money, you know? Thank you for sharing so much with our audience today. Where can people find you if they want to follow you? Yeah, so the best thing is we have a YouTube channel. It's uh, youtube.com slash my investing club. Mm. We have free trading videos. I have some live trading videos on there. Aside from that, our website, myinvestingclub.com. And that's pretty much it. You can find me pretty much on those two places. That's the easiest accessible. And yeah, this is awesome. Thank you so much, Alex, for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. You're awesome. If you have any questions for Alex, you can leave them in the comment section below. And if you want to check out even more conversations with other pro traders, check out this playlist over here.